Hello, and welcome to the second part of Module 3, which focuses on Chapter 7, or How Cells Harvest Energy from Food. And so in this chapter, we're really going to draw some connections between ourselves and plants, and not just as organisms. Yeah, we're both living things, but in the sense of without plants or autotrophs converting sunlight into chemical energy, we really wouldn't be here at all because we need to use the products of photosynthesis in our own cells. So we need that sugar that we take in through our mouths and we need that oxygen that autotrophs give out as a byproduct of photosynthesis. We need food and we need oxygen and we get them from plants and other autotrophs. So in this chapter, there are a lot of nitty-gritty details, but what I'm going to do to make it more palatable and more connective and more memorable for you is liken the entire thing to a set of analogies. So hang on, here we go. I will bring up the objectives next and we will go from there. All right, so the basic overview of chapter seven and the skills that I'd like you to take away from this chapter are that you have um, a general understanding of cellular respiration and where it is that we find energy in food. And so we're going to follow that whole process in its three different steps, kind of generally speaking, because there are a lot of terms and enzymes and other molecules to remember, but I want you to remember the, the gist of it. So respiration without oxygen is actually possible. And it's something that we can do when we anaerobically respirate. So when we are sprinting or like wrestlers do this and football players and um, boulders do this. Um, respiration with oxygen, that is aerobic respiration. So that's what we're going to use when we run marathons and ride a bike and things like that. So, and we're going to keep in mind that it's not just glucose that we can break down in cellular respiration. We can also break down other food molecules for this process, but glucose is going to be the most effective and most efficient molecule. Like I said in the previous video, the first part of module three, in the photosynthesis lecture, we talked about the equation or the chemical formula for photosynthesis. And I had indicated that cellular respiration's formula is simply the opposite. Of photosynthesis is. And so here you see that formula. So here is the glucose or the sugar that we take in as well as the oxygen that we breathe in. And we actually are able to convert these molecules to CO2 and water. So this process is happening cellularly, but it also happens kind of on a macro scale where if you think, you know, when what we take into our mouths is, well, sugar, and other molecules, we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2, and if you ever breathe out and um, hold your mouth near a, a window pane, you'll also see some water vapor. So that's that water that we're breathing out as well. So not only do we breathe this stuff out, but our cells um, kind of export these products out of us. And these molecules are then used by um, autotrophs or plants and algae and photosynthesizing bacteria in order for them to make their own food and subsequently oxygen as a byproduct. So it's a really nice relationship that photosynthesis and cellular respiration have. And so to make this whole thing a bit more understandable, we are going to move to some analogies. So I've prepared a document for us to use. It will be posted on Blackboard and let's go to that now. So here we go with our analogy. I want to ask you, and just go with me on this, if you put a piece of food in your mouth and you chew it up and you just spit it back out, how much energy do you think you can get from that process? Well, not too much, right? You're not going to get too much energy from that food. Um, I mean, there's such a negligible amount of uh, digestion and um, absorption that happens in the mouth. So if you look at the first step in cellular respiration, I'm going to make an analogy between food in mouth and glycolysis. So glycolysis is the first step in cellular respiration. It produces two ATP and it happens 
in the cytoplasm, wherein glucose is broken down into two pyruvate molecules. All right, the next portion of our analogy is that I want you to imagine that you, know, you put the food in your mouth and the food has gone down to your esophagus and it may have made it to the stomach, but it's not going to stay there. And so it gets vomited up. So that is analogous to the Krebs cycle <laughs> in the sense that only two ATP are made. So if you put some food in your mouth, it makes it to your esophagus and you spit it up, you're not going to get too much energy from that food. So if this food made it to the stomach, the stomach of uh, the cellular respiration process is like the Krebs cycle, and that happens in mitochondria. And what happens there is that two ATP are produced, two carbon acetyl coenzyme A are formed from those pyruvates that we saw up here in glycolysis, and they're added to a four carbon sugar, producing a six carbon molecule. So two of those carbons are removed as carbon dioxide, leaving as a four carbon molecule, um, or, or leaving just a four carbon molecule an ATP. So only two ATP there, and two ATP there, glycolysis being the first step, Krebs being the second step. And so this is without oxygen. And this one is with oxygen. All right, and now we get to the final step of cellular respiration, which is where most of the energy is produced. So back to our analogy, we have put the food in our mouth, it has made it down to our stomach, and it has now arrived at the small intestine. So um, in anatomy and physiology, we actually learn that most um, nutrient absorption happens in the small intestine. So we get most of the energy from the food we eat um, through the small intestinal walls. So my analogy there is that the electron transport chain actually produces 32 ATP, which is ginormous compared to the other steps. <clears throat> the electron transport chain is what produces this ATP, and that is located in the inner mitochondrial membrane. We're going to add this to the... well, change that there. So, the rest of the details here are that some um, molecules that carry electrons carry them to the inner mitochondrial membrane there we go where their electrons that's what i mean by e minus because they're negatively charged are sent down the electrons transport chain to power um, atp synthase which is a protein pump um, by pumping hydrogen ions out into the intermembrane space of the mitochondrion which what happens next is ATP is then able to be made from the synthesis of ADP and inorganic phosphate. So that is my food esophagus stomach small intestine analogy to glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and ETC. So we get the most production of ATP in the electron transport chain just as we get most of the energy from our food in our small intestine. All right, so to bring this full circle, I am literally sitting right now inside the circle of life. And so what I want you to see from this drawing is that right here, we've got the reactants in photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water, get converted using light energy into sugar and oxygen which then become the reactants in cellular respiration happening down here in the mitochondria in three steps. The G is for glycolysis, CK is for Krebs cycle, and ETC, electron transport chain. Those products are now the 
reactants in photosynthesis. So this is what I mean when I said earlier that we need plants, but plants don't need us. So this whole thing is what I refer to as the circle of life. Like I mentioned in one of our earlier objectives, glucose is not the only food molecule that we can get energy from, um, because glucose and sugars aren't the only thing that we eat, right? So proteins and fats can also be broken down by our bodies and we can get nutrients from them. So here's a great diagram of how cells actually get energy from the foods that we put into our bodies. And so those molecules that are in the foods that we eat need to be first broken down into smaller parts until they can be absorbed through our small intestine. So here's putting this in the big picture. Here is a chain of carbohydrates, polysaccharides, that, get, um, that are made up of glucose units or um, sugar monomers, and then they can go this, through this whole process of Krebs cycle just like we talked about, and as well as the other macromolecules can go through a similar process so that we can extract nutrients from them. To wrap up this module, I want you to keep in mind um, the law that states that matter can be neither created nor destroyed and energy can be neither created nor destroyed. So when you think of those two major laws and then you bring in chapter six and seven, I think you can start to see excuse me, I had to sneeze. I think you can start to see why these tiny microscopic cellular processes matter in the grand scheme of things. So one of the assignments that you have this week is to write a circle of life essay in which you detail the relationships between autotrophs or plants and heterotrophs, us. So photosynthesizers and cellularly respirating organisms and how we really depend on the food and the oxygen that the photo autotrophs give us. So I hope that was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions and have a great rest of your week. Thanks.